Hi, this is Mrs. Brubel. This is Chapter 4, Structure of the Atom, Part 2. So in this video, we're going to look at how the subatomic particles were determined and what were their relative charges and mass. And then we're going to look at the structure of the atom and where these subatomic particles are located. And then we're going to correctly explain the role of the atomic number and how it relates to the identity of the atom. So from the last video, you saw that Democritus and Dalton were the ones that were able to find or to reason out the fact that um, the atom was considered the smallest possible particle. Now, um, with the advent of cathode rays, they were able to um, generate this beam of matter, and they were trying to figure out what is in this beam of matter. Well, there was a man by the name of J.J. Thompson who was able to discover that it had to be smaller than an atom. So how he did it is he essentially took what they call a cathode ray, and a cathode ray is essentially a tube that all the air has been sucked out, and they took a, a high voltage source, a battery, and they were able to get beam of particles to enter a hole and then to sort of bounce off the back side of the tube. Now what was different about Thompson is he actually took a magnet and as he applied the magnet to the tube he noticed it deflected. And what he did was he measured the angle of the deflection and he was able to get a charge to mass ratio. Now when he got this charge to mass ratio he found out that there was no way that it was bigger than a hydrogen atom. So he concluded that this matter had to be smaller than a hydrogen atom. And eventually they called this the electron. Now, um, they knew the charge to mass ratio, but they didn't know the actual mass of the matter that they had discovered. So Millikan, he took a very ingenious um, experiment. He took oil and he had like a perfume sprayer and he got these bits of oil to become tiny drops. And what he did was he then applied an electric field to these tiny drops. And notice you have a disc here, sort of like the cathode ray tube, and you have tiny drops of oil coming through the hole. Now, using physics, he was able to calculate the rate of them falling, and as he increased or decreased the electric field, he was actually able to calculate uh, the mass of the electron. Okay, so JJ found the charge to mass ratio. Millikan actually discovered the mass of the electron and they were trying to figure out how does this subatomic particle work in the atom. So J.J. Thompson, because he was British, he came up with what he knew, and he knew that atoms had to be neutral because when you touch somebody, you don't get a charge or a zap. So he thought, well, let's make the atom like plum pudding. So plum pudding is sort of like a custard made with bread and he determined that the electron, which he got from the cathode ray tube, um, was negatively charged. And he assumed that because of the magnetic field that he applied to it. So there had to be something in there that would offset that negative charge. And he considered the other part of the atom to be that positive charge or that pudding. Now, there was a man by the name of Rutherford that wanted to confirm or um, maybe deny this thought of the subatomic structure. So what he did was he took a radioactive source and he essentially shot it through a piece of gold foil. So at the time that they were running this experiment, they were able to get a very thin piece of gold foil that was pretty close to an atom in thickness. And he didn't just look at uh, the particles running through the foil, he actually looked at what happened as they came out. Now, if it was the plum pudding model, he assumed that he would get 
uh, deflection every once in a while. Now the bizarre thing is he got a lot more of undeflected particles than he did with the deflected. So what was going on there? So this is his result. Notice that these arrows that go straight through to the right, there's a lot more of them than there are arrows that get deflected back. And his conclusion was that the atom most likely was empty space. And occasionally when the alpha particles, which should have been big enough, they would hit a tiny part of the atom. And that tiny part ended up being the nucleus. And he also concluded because of the deflection, the nucleus had to be positively charged. So here is a modern day picture of what we know the atom to look like. And notice that the, the nucleus is very tiny compared to the overall shape of the atom. Uh, the electrons actually occupy a huge space within the atom. And we know now that the nucleus is tiny and positive. Okay, so another person by the name of Mosley, he actually discovered that each atom of different elements has to have a unique positive charge. So because of this discovery, they determined that um, protons, which are found in the nucleus, have to be positively charged. So with this result, he determined that the number of protons in an atom has to determine the element or the atomic number. So from the periodic table, if you look, a lot of tables are set up this way. The name is at the top. Underneath the name is the atomic number, which is the number of protons. Then we'll have the element symbol. And then underneath that will be the mass of the atom. And we'll talk more about the mass in future video. Okay, so in summary, um, through J.J. Thompson and um, Milken, they determined that electrons have a negative charge. And then through the efforts of Rutherford and Mosley, they discovered that protons in the nucleus have a positive charge. Because of Rutherford's experiment, um, the atom has to consist of mostly empty space and that Mosley determined that the positively charged nucleus contains a certain number of protons and that certain number of protons actually determines the type of element. And because the atoms exist as neutral species, um, the number of protons has to equal the number of electrons.